Yeah, let's get started. So welcome everyone to Building Emotional Resilience Against Climate Distress. Uh, as a quick introduction, my name is Sophia Leon. I am the Nutrition Education Coordinator here um, in the School Gardens Program at Grow NYC. Um, I really wanted to have this event about climate anxiety and climate distress as it's something that I myself have felt for many years at this point. Um, and I felt really validated when I realized that by talking to other people and reading articles about it, that it really is a real phenomenon. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for being here today uh, to talk about this really important aspect of the climate crisis. Uh, hi, and my name is Daniil Foster Russell. Uh, I work for the Zero Race Schools program here at Grow NYC and the assistant director. And um, I'm really excited that we were able to create this space for students uh, to share their feelings and share their experience with climate anxiety and climate distress. Um, I feel like I've experienced it myself, just like Sophia, uh, for many, many years and did not have a, a name for it. And so I'm really grateful that Dr. Wendy Greenspan has been doing research on this and putting a name to it. And so we feel privileged to be able to create this space for students and for and for all of our guests to come in and learn something or share with us. So um, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, so we work for an organization called Grow NYC. I'm sure many of you guys might be familiar with Grow NYC. Um, we are an environmental nonprofit that is based in New York City. We are a 50 year old organization. Um, and we've been doing so much work in, in New York City over the last five decades. Um, you might have noticed our flagship program or most noticeable, most popular program, uh, the Green Markets. Uh, there is a popular one at Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. There's another one at Union Square in Manhattan, and there are many, many others. Uh, well, we also do a lot of other kind of work as well, um, namely the Zero Waste Schools program that like myself um, and Cami work for, and Sophia's program, uh, School Gardens, uh, along with just uh, of so much other work. We support folks um, all over the city. And just so that uh, I think folks can understand why we do this work. And we are here to protect the environment, to create green spaces, to help people stay healthy and give them the opportunity to make an, a positive impact in their lives. And I feel uh, really connected to this um, mission and it really guides my work. I feel like it um, sort of helps me understand exactly why I'm doing this work. So um, that's us for Grow NYC. A little bit more about how we organize ourselves. Uh, around the work, Kami, you can go to the next slide. The slide before that, yes. So our work is organized in four different pillars, I'd like to say, conservation, green spaces, food access, and agriculture and education in both Zero Waste Schools and uh, the School Gardens Program falls under the education section, hence the reason we are creating spaces for students and teachers and educators all over the city. So um, we hope that you find this a positive experience. And just a quick quick overview of how this discussion will go. We are currently doing introductions. Um, then we will have our open discussion with the students and Dr. Greenspun uh, for about 40 minutes, followed by time for questions and answers from the audience um, and show off uh, different ways that you can connect with us here at Grow NYC. Sorry, I lost my little mute and unmute button for a second. My name is Cami Camila Guzman. I am. Uh, I work for Grow NYC Zero Waste Schools. I'm an outreach coordinator. I'm super excited to be here. I am going to be here supporting our amazing panelists, uh, Dr. Greenspun and Daniel and Sophia, in orchestrating this event and beginning this event. I'll just be taking over the Q and A and the chat. So while we're at today's roundtable, you can submit any questions relating to today's topic, climate anxiety and climate distress that you feel would like to be answered in the q and I will be looking at that. This will be recording and it will be set, this is recorded <laughs> and it will be sent to you in a follow-up email. We do encourage you to use the chat to engage with your peers. If you identify with something, please let us know. We love to hear from you. This really is us trying to make this virtual roundtable as least virtual as possible. So I really hope that you engage with us um, in any way that you can. 
So just a reminder, the questions that you would like answered will be in the Q&A, but engage with us in the chat. Um, so these are our community agreements. Respect comes first, one mic, keep an open mind, and this is a brave space. So we're, we're going to give each of our panelists uh, a, a minute or so to introduce themselves so you know exactly who they are. Um, just very quickly, we have Dr. Wendy Greenspun with us. We've got uh, Annalise Mendez and Jacob Tavares, Ella Vith and Ulysses Ponce. Each of them will, will, will take a minute or so to tell you exactly who they are and where they're coming from. Um, Dr. Greenspun, would you want, like to start us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. So hi, I'm Dr. Wendy Greenspun. I'm a clinical psychologist. I actually lately call myself a climate psychologist because that has been my primary focus. So I'm in private practice. I also am part of the Climate Psychology Alliance of North America. I've been doing a lot of educating of mental health clinicians so they understand about the climate crisis and the emotional and mental health impacts. Um, I do a lot of clinical work in this area, people coming to me for help with their climate distress. I run something called climate cafes where groups of people get together so they share and reflect on the emotions that are coming up for them. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also um, leading workshops for students, for climate activists on how to build psychological resilience in the face of the climate crisis. So. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to get to talk to the other panelists today. Ella? Um, hi, my name is Ella V. I'm in the 10th grade at Museum School. And this is so important to me because I've always felt climate anxiety, but I've never really put a name to it. So when finding out that this is a thing that other people have experienced, it just feels really good to talk to others about it, especially when I'm feeling like helpless and feeling like I can't really do anything to stop climate change. Um, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Annalise Mendez. I'm in the 11th grade. I go to St. Vincent Fair High School. Um, this is important to me because personally, I wasn't aware that there was such thing as climate anxiety. So I think it's important to make it aware to those who also felt the same way as me and how we can tend to our feelings. Okay, I'll go now because, uh, yeah. So I'm in, <laughs> I'm in grade as well. And I go to New Heights Academy. You know, it's important to me too because it's one of those things that you can feel, but you don't find a description of and you can't find that thing to pinpoint. So, you know, a lot of people can experience climate anxiety, but it's just something you can't pinpoint until it's actually told to you. Hi, my name is Ulysses. I'm a junior at the Bronx High School of Science. And this is important to me because I feel like climate change is simultaneously a problem that is treated as distant, but at the same time can affect us in ways that are very close to us and that we have to kind of learn how to acknowledge and think about in not just productive ways, but in ways that can like, you know, sort of help us emotionally and mentally. And I think it's important to open up those sorts of discussions. And that's why I want to discuss this. Thank you guys for sharing. Uh, now we wanna hear from our audience members. And so the way we wanna do that is by deploying a poll with three questions. We want you to answer the poll questions themselves. If you're having trouble answering that, then you can answer in the chat, but we really want we want the data. So um, I'm gonna launch the poll now, get ready to answer. We wanna know your experience with climate anxiety. Let me know if you can see the poll, if you're able to participate. Okay. 
Okay, I see some responses coming in. So those questions have to do with, do you feel anxious or distressed due to the climate, due to climate change? Uh, the other question is, what are some things that trigger your climate anxiety? And then the last question is, when is your first memory of climate anxiety? Um, yes, looks like the majority of folks, people are still answering, okay. We'll give you guys until 60 seconds and then we'll, we'll end the poll. Sounds good? Okay. All right. Um, the polls ended. Uh, so it looks like most of most people feel anxious about the climate uh, sometimes, and then some people uh, always feel that way. And then uh, a few people are, aren't really sure, which kind of rings true uh, compared to what our students were saying. Like it, they're not sure if what they're feeling is climate anxiety, which is also extremely valid. Um, we're seeing that people feel like anxious about the news. Uh, mostly they feel like anxious about weather, the weather events, wildfires and floods and social media does not help. Um, let's see, and then folks started to feel anxious about, most people feel, felt anxious about climate anxiety during their adulthood. It started for some people in adolescence and for some in childhood. Um, thank you for participating. I'm gonna share the results. We also have some other triggers people are writing in the chat, like nice. working with students and observing their emotions um recycling and composting questioning how much impact that even has at this point i've definitely felt that personally um watching their child grow um, and engaging in non-earth friendly actions in daily life yeah so all of these are very valid and it's interesting to just see the data on what our audience is feeling re relating to climate anxiety thank you for sharing that with us Kami, you can take us to the next slide. Dr. Greenspun, do you want to go over? Sure, uh, sure. I, was, I wasn't sure if it was gonna be any larger. So I, I thought to frame our discussion and it really follows from what both the poll showed and what our student panelists already talked about, there was this very wide scale study of adolescent and young adults, 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25 in 10 countries across the world were surveyed about their feelings, their reactions to climate inaction. And the results really tell us that there is validity to what we're discussing today, this climate distress and anxiety. 80% of these young people who were surveyed said that they had felt betrayed by adults and governments in the lack of action on climate change. Almost half reported negative impacts on their daily functioning, things like their ability to focus, their appetite, their sleep. Levels of distress, not surprisingly, were higher in areas where people were already feeling the direct impacts of climate change or environmental harm or environmental injustice. Over half felt anxious, powerless, sad, afraid. These are some of the emotions I'm gonna talk about when we discuss climate distress. Um, other difficult emotions also were there and 56% of these young people said they felt that humanity is doomed. So we really do see that across the world, young people are really struggling with their feelings about what's happening. All right, I think that covered the slide. Dr. Greenspan, I wanna share that link to folks in the, in the chat. That's a, an article um, that sort of summarizes that study. And then the actual study I think can be found at this link I just posted. Um, So thank you for legitimizing that for us. I mean, I think um, it, it's, it's so important that people like you are doing the work that you're doing because it really helps practitioners and students and educators and just you know anyone experiencing climate anxiety sort of figure out how to find tools for it and then and then keep doing the work around mitigating it. 
Yeah, so just uh, going based off of that, the first question that we have for Dr. Greenspun is how would you define climate distress or climate anxiety, just to get us all on the same page for the rest of this discussion? That's great. It's, it's a great place to start. I think the term climate anxiety is probably what people have heard most often, climate anxiety, eco-anxiety. I like to use the broader term of climate distress because I think people aren't just feeling anxiety. Anxiety is one of many emotional reactions. So anxiety, fear, panic even, but there's a range of emotions like guilt and shame for feeling complicit or that I'm part of the problem or not doing enough. There's anger, rage, frustration. There is sadness, depression, grief, climate grief, eco grief, people talk about that. And then there can be sort of a numbing or a desensitization or even a paralysis, kind of a shutting down. And probably many, many more reactions, all of which I consider reasonable, expectable, and they're probably signs that we care about what's happening. And when we care, we feel motivated to want to help to make changes. So I think the emotions are really important. We just have to find ways to manage the emotions, process the emotions, and transform them into something useful. That's my my response, and I'd be curious as we go along how others relate to some of that. Do you want me to move into talk, asking the students some questions? Is that? Yes, we would. Yes, you know, if you want to take it off from there, that'd be great. We, Sophia and I will now just sort of hang back and and listen to our panelists talk about this experience. Um, and again, I'm just so grateful to have the students here because I think one way to help with climate distress and anxiety is what some of you have already named, which is having it named, having it validated that it's real, that what you're going through is real. And I think we all need to listen and we need to really listen to what, what young people have to say. So thank you. So I guess my first question um, to our student panelists would be, how has climate anxiety shown up in your lives and in the lives of your friends and other peers? What, what are you seeing? What are you experiencing? I think for me, as well as many as, I think for me, as well as many of my other friends and my peers, we weren't aware of the feelings that we were feeling due to the climate change had a title to like begin with, but we knew that we felt some sort of anxiety or distress towards it. Um, I think our climate anxieties have always been like a constant thing at the back of our mind that we just haven't discussed often. Cause like, at least for me, most of my life, I've heard terms like phrases like, oh, the world is ending and like people are creating our own demise. And so and that's always just at the back of my mind. And I think this feeling of fear has like just been building up in us for a long time, but now there are like more accessible news outlets for us, so our fear has just been skyrocketing at this point. Yeah. Anyone else want to answer? Um, I think that when uh, Annalise mentioned that thing about how, you know, some of us kind of say like the world is ending, I think that I definitely sort of think about the sorts of things that like my peers say at school. Um, we had a walkout a couple of weeks ago and I remember seeing that a lot of the signs were like these uh, symbols of like the earth and it was like on fire or the earth and it was like melting. Like they're, these are like very intense depictions of what like people are feeling. A lot of people went to the walkout and, you know, they kind of made an event out of it. But at the same time, like behind a lot of that, I think that a lot of people kind of don't want to show in public that they're like freaking out but you know you can kind of see in some of that art that like a lot of people you know they they feel something about it they feel this like impending doom and I think that we definitely sort of like our age group feels a lot of that it almost sounds like if you just scratch the surface a little it's all sitting there yeah
Anyone else? Ella? Sure. So also for me, yeah, like what the media, the news is always saying, like there's even a countdown in Union Square. I think that's what it's for. Like how many years we have left until all of the damage is irreversible. And I, I go to Union Square every day and just seeing that really freaks me out because no one, not, I don't want to say that no one cares, but there's not enough people that are trying to put an effort that will actually like stop the effects of climate change to a point where we can like save our earth and that just, that's really Yeah. Yeah, that's really sad. Well, that, that, that makes me think of an, another que question, which is what are the triggers that have increased your climate anxiety or distress? I think it was already mentioned, but social media has been a major contributor to climate anxiety and distress. I mean, whenever something happens, social media has a way of just blowing it out of proportion, like with the titles. And so... And like for me personally, like when I see one thing, I like go do research and I go on to the next thing. And so then the anxiety just keeps building up and building up. And so maybe I do it to myself, but that's what happens when I see stuff on social media. Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people go through that. You think you're going to learn things that are helpful, but often it, it increases the anxiety. And so limiting how much you do that, I think a lot of people have found is helpful for coping. Anyone else want to say anything about triggers? Um, yeah, I think that social media, you know, along with what Annalise was saying earlier about like the news in general, like accessibility of you know news about the climate crisis is a good thing it's good to be informed but it's a lot like media is everywhere now and especially with social media you know even within like our personal circles a lot of stuff gets shared around that can you know really stress us out I think that for me personally it's kind of disheartening that sometimes we see stuff online that kind of wants to induce climate distress on purpose. I think that some groups do purposefully, whether it be for um, like six, what is it? Oh my God, virtue signaling. Um, they, they kind of want you to either act now or like you're the bad guy. And it's definitely a tactic, I guess, but it's also important to consider like how people on the other end are actually feeling like what kind of motivations are you giving them or what kind of emotions are you inducing to them by, you know, scaring them in this way? It can have a lot more impacts than people think. That, that's such an excellent point. And climate communicators talk about this a lot. You know, how do you raise enough concern that people want to take action and take it seriously, but not so much that it causes just distress and overwhelm. So finding that balance, I think that's one of the ways I think about building resilience, finding that middle ground. So you really named it really well. Anyone else about triggers? We can move on if not. So what, what is the hardest part about feeling anxiety related to climate change? What do you find most difficult? Um, the most difficult for me definitely is the more I do research on it, the more I feel like I'm just one person in this huge world who, and I can't really stop any effects. Even if I try to do my best to like, to live my life sustainably and everything, I'm still just one person. And you feel a little hopeless. And 
also there are some people who still don't believe that climate change is a real thing and they can't relate to what you're saying. So you really feel like no one's listening to you or people just don't take it seriously and it's just frustrating. So that sense of feeling small in the face of something so big and then when other people, when you feel alone or, or that not enough people are engaged and that, yeah, that has an impact. I think of there, there's a, I think it's an African proverb that says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. Um, and it's a, it's a reminder that we, we all can make small changes and then that can create ripple effects of getting more people involved in raising awareness. But, but I also know how big this gigantic problem of the climate crisis is and we can feel really small and know how enormous and complicated the problem is so I think both are true yeah anyone else want to say something about what's the hardest part for you about feeling the climate anxiety or the stress um I'll go um so I think it was today I like mentioned to one of my oh I'm going to be doing this panel and I was explaining it to her and she was like well, like, I can't make a change. So why does it really matter? And I just got angry because it's so obvious that she just wasn't as like informed as I was, but you can't really get angry at a person who's not informed. So I think there's like um, Ella said, that hopeless feeling and anger for me. Yeah. So when, when you feel like others aren't engaging in the same way and that that can feel, again, so frustrating and not knowing what to do with those feelings. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I'll add on. Okay. I think that just in general before you can even like take any action. I think that a lot of us kind of get stuck on this first stage of trying to decide who to blame. Like, do I blame myself? Do I blame other people? Do I blame everyone? Do I blame one corporation, one company? Like we just kind of get stuck on the like mm, accountability part of it, which is so important, but like, you kind of realize that like everyone is to blame and no specific person is to blame. It's like, it's just everywhere. And I think that that's like anxiety in and of itself. Like anxiety is this feeling where like, it feels like everything is against you or, you know, you blame yourself and it's just like so big that it's kind of hard to like process that and you know act on it and I think that that's like the scariest thing about it yeah so the enormity of it the, the bigness of it there was a philosopher who um who called the climate crisis a hyper object something that's so big that you can't see the contours of it it's so big across space and time and and our minds don't know what to do with something so enormous so that you're right and Again, some of the resilient strategies can be like focusing on a small manageable piece of it or what piece you can address. Uh, because if we try to tackle all of it, we will feel small and hopeless, hopeless helpless. Um, but uh, but I, I appreciated Ulysses that you named that that's the first step is just, just the enormity of it and not knowing what to do and then feeling that you're part of it or who's responsible for this, trying to make sense of it. So this is really, really um, difficult. Yeah, appreciate that. Jacob, anything you would like to add about your own? What's been the most difficult for you in climate anxiety or distress? All right, so the hardest part for me is like Annalise said, a lot of people who want to believe that they don't have an impact when they really can, because people, a lot of the time, they believe that 
they have to tackle one of like the biggest issues when they could start off small and create a snowball effect that could then, you know, get a larger group of people to then tackle this large issue, which I feel like people, instead of like thinking about the snowball effect, they immediately cut to thinking about, oh yeah, I can't tackle this massive corporation because it's only me. Instead of thinking, oh, what ways can I just prevent this? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, there's there's a definition of optimism that is not about believing everything's going to be fine and good, but optimism is focusing on the things you can control rather than dwelling on all the many things that we can't control. And so I think that's a useful framework to, to think about with that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question, which is about coping. So what kinds of methods, both healthy and maybe unhealthy, are you all using to cope? And what have you noticed in your friends and peers in terms of how they are trying to cope with their climate distress? So I feel like a lot of, one of the ways healthy people cope with climate anxiety is simply, you know, composting, you know, doing their small steps, you know, like I said before, snowball effect into a greater issue. But I feel like one of the biggest issues, especially I feel like in this country and in New York City is this greenwashing effect that people want to believe. And instead of, you know, making their own sacrifices, like using the car less or doing something else, they buy like a lot of these products that like make it seem like it's better when it does it does some impact but the impact it does is basically lost because of how much it takes to get that product here because of all the shipping all that kind of stuff and i feel like people use this as a way to cope instead of actually tackling the real issue which is you know climate change and their climate anxiety so i feel like greenwashing is one of those unhealthy ways especially in our country that you know people like buying a lot of stuff that they don't want to give up so but people also do it in healthy ways like composting and all that kind of stuff so you know there's different ways thank you so you're really naming the taking of action healthy and unhealthy useful and not useful can be a way of coping um also some a unhealthy way to cope is definitely just ignoring the issue, saying like, oh, there's no such thing as climate change. The, uh, the world is just getting warmer because it's getting closer to the sun or just like making up information just to make themselves feel better. And even if it means taking like really, really tiny steps, anything, it's still moving forward than just being in denial. Like something that I learned to do is I uh, calculate the amount of energy I, I need to do everything in a day. So like even taking a snack out of my fridge that it, it needs energy to run and it needs to be like, coal is burned or something. So I try to calculate it. And every day I try to do things that would take less energy to produce. So it does like less of a harm on the earth. So you really try to focus on your own individual behavior and the impact and being thoughtful and aware. Um, and that helps you feel like you're contributing, that you're doing something and build from there. Anyone else? Um, for me, like this, like the small things that I do to like cope in a way, it's like, let's say I'm in school and then I see somebody like throw out, let's say like a plastic water bottle in the trash can. It's kind of nasty, but I go out of my way to take it out of the trash can to put it in the recycling bin. And that makes me feel good about myself. Cause I'm like, I mean, I hope I tried. I went out of my way, I helped a little bit. So, and then like, the, the organization I'm a part of, the Brotherhood Sister Soul, we have like a garden near us. And so that makes me feel like, oh, I'm like helping the earth a little bit. So that makes me feel good. 
That's great. So you're you're really saying you can pay attention to how good you feel when you are taking action and recognizing that and and that's important because it builds more willingness to keep doing it when you're feeling good about that. So that's really helpful. Yeah. All right. How about what's your earliest memory of of climate anxiety or climate distress? When did you first start feeling it? What memory do you have? Um, for me personally, I feel like it's something that I've probably been aware of for a long time, like the climate crisis, just because of the news and stuff. Um, but I think that one of the earliest things that I can remember is like the BP oil spill uh, in 2010. Uh, I remember that I was like five, but I was like watching the news and there was just like this big like thing of oil like out in the Gulf of Mexico, I think it was. And I remember like wondering like, oh, you know, it's gonna take them a while to clean that up. Like maybe like a week or like two weeks, maybe, maybe a month. And like, I, I don't know who I asked. It must've been like some adult in my life. I was like, how long is that gonna take to clean up? Like, how are they gonna do that? And it was just like, I kind of had to like face the reality of it, you know, not just the reality that like these things are time consuming, but that when it like all adds up, there's just a lot of stuff that we're doing that we just can't really take back in a direct way sometimes. So it's all just like a big chain reaction of things and it's hard to deal with, but. Yeah, that's a great example how a big event kind of catches our attention and maybe breaks through the, the sense that everything's okay. And so that, that can raise awareness for sure. Who else is willing to share their first memory? Um, it was, I think it was in elementary school, maybe first or second grade. But I remember our, my teacher like showed us a video and it was like, oh, there's a hole in the ozone layer. And I like actually thought that there was like a hole in the ozone layer. And that was like a lot of stress for me. I was like, why is there a hole in the ozone layer? Like what's going on? And maybe she explained climate change to us. I'm not sure I was in second or first grade, but that was like my first memory for me seeing that video. Wow, so, so media, movies, stories sometimes alert us to what's going on. It sounds like you didn't have anyone who helped you understand the, the picture. And so that, again, maybe back to Ulysses, your point earlier about when you don't understand something where you don't know what to make of it, it, it raises the distress for sure. So understanding can help. For me, when I was younger, I really wasn't presented with a lot of information on climate change. So I didn't know that it was such a big thing that it was going on. But I think that once I got to middle school, um, there would be people coming in, holding assemblies, teaching us about the dangers of climate change and ways to recycle, just teaching us the basic steps that we could do to move forward. And when I found out, I was like, what? Why didn't anyone tell me? So I started freaking out. And I think that's even when my climate anxiety started because all of this information just got like pushed onto me and it was just very hard to take it. Wow, yeah, yeah. So no one helping you know what to do with those feelings once that awareness was there. It's really hard, yeah. Um, let me go on to another question. Does climate change and climate distress mean anything to you culturally? Have you been talking about it in your family? Because we know that there's also environmental injustice that's embedded in the climate crisis. There's all kinds of cultural meanings. So I'd be very interested to know. Um, so I'm like Mexican American and my mom was born in Mexico. And I guess in one of the ways that it relates to me culturally is just like hearing about like her childhood versus kind of like what, where she lived in is like now. 
uh, I remember that she like told me a while back that like after she like left, you know, her hometown and went to America that it experienced like a really long drought. And like, I, I didn't really know about that. I, I kind of heard about like, you know, my mom's childhood. And as a child, you know, you just kind of take those stories as like, you know, something far off, something that was a long time ago. And I used to visit where like she lived. And, you know, I was just like, used to it being this almost like desert place, not this like greener, lusher place that she described with like a stream running through it. So I guess like, as I got older, I kind of had to face the reality that those two places are the same place. There is no place where she lived and the place where we go sometimes now, like that is one place. And I think that, I don't know, there's just like some things that happen that we don't always accredit to like climate change. I have no idea if, you know, that long drought was a result of climate change, but like it kind of gets you thinking like as you, you know, make these connections more often, like we lose so many places in ways that like we don't even know. There's places like out in countries we've never been to, like places, you know, that only mother nature can create that we just kind of, you know, don't really think about. I think that especially when you can kind of connect to like a homeland like that, you know, there's there's a really big cultural significance and yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that to share your family history and the, what it meant in Mexico and to your mom. Really powerful. Who else? So I'm also a Hispanic, but my family comes from Dominican Republic. So there's both sides, of my, both sides of my family. And because of climate change, you know, rising sea levels have happened. And, you know, when these rising sea levels happen, there's a more frequent uh, rate of hurricanes in the said, like, this, this, the Caribbean area. And there's like more tropical storms, more hurricanes, and they get more devastating. So like my fam, like I always kind of get scared when it's hurricane season because I always think about, you know, my family over there because they're not really, if I'm going to be honest with you, the houses are not too strong for the hurricanes and they can get easily affected. Like there's been instances where a lot of people in DR had their roofs destroyed, had their house destroyed, like all their land is flooded and, you know, having that anxiety about the frequency of hurricanes from climate change is there for me. So really that direct impact to people that you care about and knowing that it's very real really has an impact for sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, for me, my mom side is from Turkey where a lot of like earthquakes and sometimes even floods happen like it's really it happens a lot and there are some homes that get completely destroyed so ever since um I've been visiting my family there since I was younger and my grandparents they're really sustainable but I didn't really understand what it was back then so they would make sure that nothing went to waste like the water that they boil eggs in it goes to water the plants and like old cut up pieces of fabric goes into pillows so there it just it really like you learn how to become more sustainable just by living in a place that might not get a lot of new things so you just have to learn how to live with it well, thank you for sharing that. So that was really describing also the, the other side, which is learning how to live sustainably and that there's a cultural family background in terms of a focus there. So that's helpful. Anyone else? Annalise, did you want to? Um, I think Jacob covered it for me. I'm also Dominican okay. and Ecuadorian. So I think that same 
anxiety, that feeling when hurricane and um, season comes up, comes up for me like as well. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, because that, that's really hard when it's so close to your own experience and your family experience. Um, do we have time for me to ask them one more or? Do you, yeah. Okay. So I was going to ask you all, why do you think we're talking about this now? Why is it important for us to be talking together right now about this? Um. I think like, although we've known things like global warming have been like around for a really long time, I think society is now just starting to show that we care about it in a way, not saying that there were people who just didn't, like, cause there definitely were people who do care, but I think it's becoming a bigger thing now. Like, like I said before, like with the news outlets, um, I think it's important we talk about it now because like, we can find ways to correct what we're doing and how we can change our climate for the better. Although like, it seems like there isn't much we can do like with that mentality, nothing will really get done. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Why now? Um, I guess what I'll contribute is like when you're asking the question like why now it's because well a I wouldn't like it to be later and you know earlier is already passed and I know that a lot of like people say that but like it's it's just the truth like there is no moment when we like will just be like well now everyone needs to sit down and have a very like important long conversation because if that moment were to happen it should have happened already like we just kind of keep putting things off and the least we can do like as individuals is to like talk about it and deal with it now even if like some of the like biggest contributors like don't want to open up those discussions it's like our not our responsibility because we never asked to be burdened with climate change but it's definitely like for our benefit to open up these sorts of discussions and have them, if not for the greater good or whatever, to at least, you know, help us deal with it as individuals because it is a real problem. Thank you. Well, thank you both because I, I think that named the importance of growing awareness and more of a movement growing and people have begun to talk about social tipping points. We sometimes think about environmental tipping points with the climate as, as things can reach a point where it cascades into something bigger. And that can happen in social life too, that as more people get involved and care that we can reach a tipping point that helps us go in the positive direction and make the large scale urgent changes that are needed. So I think all of you participating in this today are part of this movement of raising awareness, making sure people know, and to the point of sharing with each other because that is part of how we manage the difficult emotions that come up is to know that we're not alone and that we're working together to, to try to do something good. So thank you. I think that's it for my questions. So Dr. Greenspun, I have a, the, as a panelist, we have a few questions we want to ask you. Wonderful. And I'll start off with the first question, which is how has climate anxiety shown up in your workplace environment with clients coming up to you about climate change and how they feel about it and what they're scared and, you know, anything on that sort of matter? Okay, thank you. That's a great question, Jacob. Um, I'm really seeing a lot of what you've already described. So some people are coming to me specifically because they know that I'm climate aware, climate focused. So they're coming to me because they have all kinds of anxiety, fear, grief, loss, um, anger, helplessness, all the emotions that I talked about earlier, and that's what's coming up. I also worked for many years at a, at a college counseling service, so I was working with young people 
primarily, and they were really talking, especially those who were studying fields related to climate, like environmental science or sustainability, where they were learning about what was happening in the climate and felt like their teachers weren't talking about how difficult it was to be learning and they didn't have a place to bring the emotions that were coming up. And so I think they started coming to me and I, that's when I started building these workshops about emotional resilience because they didn't know how to deal with those emotions. So I'm really seeing the range, but I also see older people, you know, parents who are worried about their children and their children's future. So that's another group that's feeling a lot of distress and educators who are working with young people are feeling it a lot. So it's really across, across the board, the kinds of distress that I've been seeing. I'm gonna um, ask a question that was actually asked in the Q&A about um, Megan Warner. She said that because there are many barriers to mental health services already, specifically in vulnerable communities um, that can't afford like therapy and other mental health services, beyond therapy, how can, um, how can we make climate mindfulness and care accessible for everybody? Oh, that is a wonderful question. And it's one of the questions that as climate psychologists, we're really trying to think about uh, because you know there's already a lack of availability of mental health services. And especially as the question, the person who asked the question um, said that, that we really do need to find other sources. So I think there are various online support groups, that's one possibility. Um, groups like uh, the Good Grief Network or Climate Cafes. I think within our communities, it doesn't have to be a mental health issue. So spiritual communities, um, churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, sources of care and you know ethical practices that we can connect with. Uh, there's a lot of work being done now in communities, building um, community resilience, and that involves helping find the natural leaders that already exist within communities and helping them learn resilience strategies to help in their communities as the crisis unfolds, but also to build cult a kind of a culture of care, that we're aware of each other, that we're there to help each other. There are also things like there's something called the Climate Journal Project, uh, where, where it's often young people, but anyone can write, write about their climate emotions and climate distress and share and sort of transform it into creative outlets. Uh, so there's many, many sources, meditation centers and practices uh, that help kind of calm the nervous system and help people be present with the range of difficult emotions. So those are all what come to mind, the, the various natural sources of care and connection and ethical practice uh, that we can that we have and that we can continue to try to build. Uh, anyone else have a question for me? Um, so I guess my question is like, how can teenagers in general like sort of cope with our feelings of climate distress? Uh, like it would be really valuable to sort of hear about your experience and like what's helped people that like actually have come to you experiencing climate distress? Sure, thank you. That's a, that's a, a great question. Um, there's probably not one single way of addressing climate distress. So, you know, part of what I do is try to make sense with the person of what the meaning is in their life. So some of what you all have already shared today about your cultural and family history helps provide some lens on it. But many, many sources. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's worth showing the slides that I created that go over the various kinds of emotional resilience that I try to help people look at. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's worth, because I can go over that. Yeah. Tammy's on it for you. OK, I figured <laughs> she was. She worked hard, hard at work. So I, I think of these 
five areas, but I, I think there are many more and I would welcome, I was already seeing so many in the chat. It was actually wonderful because the audience was adding so many things. So just as an overview, I think about calming of the nervous system, ways of managing um, our emotions, but also naming them and working with them, finding a sense of purpose, uh, being able to replenish our emotional ecosystem and re-earthing. And if we go to the next slide, I can go into a little bit more detail here. So calming, I mean, we, we know that when we feel this distress and anxiety, it can arouse that fight, flight, or freeze, you know, the sympathetic nervous system, alarm system. We don't want to stay in that heightened state of alarm. And, and many of us feel that. I know I feel that at times when I'm thinking about what's going on. And so any practice that can calm the nervous system, like deep breathing practices, you know, to one, one basic way of doing that is like breathe in slowly for the count of four, breathe out slowly for the count of four. But meditation, exercising calms our nervous system, listening to music, looking at pictures that make you smile, you know, taking out your phone when you feel distressed and look at, look at something that reminds you of a, of a nice experience. So that's all part of the calming part that I would mention. And then you could go to the next slide. Um, so the emotional engagement, that's, that's what I do in therapy, right? People come to me and share their emotions. It's important to make room for talking about, I mean, we, we need to let some of the, the painful, difficult feelings out, and especially in the, the presence of someone who is caring and helps you feel safe. That can be a friend, that can be a therapist, that can be a minister, a teacher, um, and knowing that when we get unsettled emotionally, that sometimes is the impetus to help us change and, and to grow, but that we also need to find the support and recognize if the emotions are too much. So I think I had said to someone earlier, maybe you want to cut out all that social media scrolling if it's causing you distress. So finding that we call it a window of tolerance where, where you're not overly distressed, but you're not completely shut down and turned away. We can go quickly to the next one. And purposing is finding a sense of purpose, finding meaning, thinking about who do I want to be? Like, how do I want to be in the face of this unfolding difficulty and crisis? Finding sources of meaningful action, as we said before, looking for sources of hope and courage. I, I think sometimes about people uh, considering their family history and who has gone through difficulty and how did they get through that? What are those resilience stories? I've had um, some of my clients will start a resilience journal where they write down all the ways that they've been able to overcome things or what happened that day that they felt good about and that helps shift to what's, what's positive and feels meaningful. And of course, uh, I mentioned optimism before and building a sense of community and solidarity when you're trying to take action, really helpful. Next slide quickly. Replenishment, this is one that climate activists often forget about. They're so busy taking action, doing everything right, trying to do so much, but we've got to replenish our own psychological system. So good self-care, getting enough sleep and eating well. And I know as high school students, you probably already feel the stress of everything you have to do and don't always get to do that as much as you'd like, but it's important. Creativity is important. Being able to relax and just chill and don't feel guilty about having fun. We need to have fun. That That's essential for our well-being. Um, and I think I have one more maybe. Um, Re-earthing, I think Grow NYC is a great um, example. And those of you who've been involved in these um, experiences of connecting with the more than human, the natural world, being aware of our interdependence with the natural ecosystem, with other groups of people, strengthening our ties and developing circles of support. And I can't remember if I had, I think that was it. Yeah. So. Um, so those are some of the things that I try to build when I'm when I'm talking with someone um, as part of their coping. Any other 
questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So what can parents and guardians do to help their teens cope with their climate anxiety? That's a really good question too. I'm, yes. I'm gonna but in here and say there's a couple questions in the um, Q and A that interact with that one, so I think maybe we can like loop it into one big question about um, how can parents teach our their teens, but also young children to cope with the sense of impending doom um, that seems to be going on. Okay. Yeah. No, I had noticed that in the chat too, so I'm really glad that you added that, Cami. And and I think this is where parents often feel really helpless. So I'd say the first step is to listen, to let your kids talk to you about what they're going through. I've, I've talked to some parents who say they're afraid to ask their kids what they're feeling because they don't have any answers themselves, but then the kids just feel so alone and don't feel like the parents are there for them. Whenever we're dealing with something difficult, we don't always have answers, but being able to be open to hearing and sharing. Someone once said to me, you know, if your child has a fever, you can't necessarily make them all better right away, but you can be there with them. You can hold their hand. You can put your hand on their forehead. Um, that kind of comfort and care and love is really essential in being able to manage the difficulty. And then I think parents can also help their kids with some of the ideas that I just shared, like purposing. How do you find meaning? What, what can we engage with as a family that would feel meaningful? Let's all put our heads together about what we care about. Maybe we do something in our neighborhood and we get neighbors to join us in a project to reduce plastic at the local grocery store or you know, something that's meaningful and that it feels like as a family, we're working together to, um, to make whatever changes, to say that we care about this, to believe that we can have a sense of purpose and we can, we can embrace certain values that are important to our family. And with little kids, I think it can be just helping them learn to be caring and to care about maybe growing plants or caring for the natural world, world that helps again, build those values of care and concern. And, and again, just be there to listen, not overdo it with the information or the facts, but, but with the emotional caring, I think that's really um, useful. Um, I had two last questions and you kind of touched on things that we um, should do like to cope with climate anxiety and distress, but what are some things that you like hear often that we shouldn't do to cope? Ah, that we shouldn't do to cope, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that's a great question too. I, I really appreciate that. I think that when we tend to go to extremes, that's probably not helpful coping. I think the idea of balance is very useful. So an extreme could be, and believe me, I probably did this at the beginning of my getting very involved in learning about climate. I was talking to everyone about how urgent it was and how terrible things were. And I felt like I had to talk about it all the time. And it didn't help them because they just backed away from me. And it certainly didn't help me because I felt kind of bad that I was spoiling whatever the event or experience was I was having. So that probably doesn't help anyone. I, I had to learn to kind of calm my own emotions and talk in more, um, I don't know, open and vulnerable ways about, you know, what I care about or what I'm worried about instead of blasting people. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, I think also completely shutting down is not helpful. And sometimes we do want to turn away because it's too painful. We have um, psychological defense mechanisms, right? That sort of protect us from feeling overwhelmed and, and they're useful and they're necessary. But if we use them all the time where we turn away and can't engage and also don't just, um, we can't just always suppress our feelings because that lives inside of us in some way and comes out sometimes indirectly. I think also sometimes people um, get involved in uh, wanting to calm their emotions through unhealthy coping, like using alcohol and drugs excessively to kind of numb the feelings or, or move away or getting um, 
manic activity or working too hard. So again, that idea of balance, I think is really essential. So thank you for that question. I'm gonna tag along here with a question from an audience member that goes just along what you were saying. Um, balance is so important. So this audience member is asking, how do we balance wanting to be informed and being anxious when reading or watching the news? Is there a certain way or source or tactic that can help because it's really easy then to kind of unplug and avoid the news entirely. Yes, so that's, a, that's, that's a great, great question. And there's, there's probably no exact science to that. I think you need to pay attention to your own responses so that if you find you're reading something and, you know, pay attention to what's going on in your body. Is my heart rate increasing? Am I starting to ruminate and think too much about it? That might be a signal like, okay, I think that's telling me that this is a little too much and I need to take a break from it and I need to do something else. Or sometimes with my clients, I'll have them alternate reading negative climate news that they feel sort of almost compelled to read with something positive. So go research on the internet what solutions are going on out there. There are lots of organizations. I can think of one project, Drawdown, which is about, you know, at least 80 or I think it's now 100 climate solutions. And it's amazing to see what is being done, what efforts are made. Um, so now when I teach uh, mental health professionals, even we teach about what's going on in the climate and what's difficult, the embedded psychosocial traumas, and we talk about solutions and we have people pay attention to how they feel inside with those different pieces of information and use that as balance. Um, okay, so my last question to ask you is, how can you take anxiety and turn it into something that benefits you? Ah, beautiful, beautiful question. Um, I, I sometimes use the term composting our emotions. You know, when you think of composting, that we, we take sort of waste products or things that we're throwing away and then we mix it with soil and all kinds of things that actually helps create something fertile. So negative or difficult emotions can be composted, but we have to add certain other ingredients. So it's a, it's a great question. And often anxiety, as I said before, is a sign that we care. And if we care, we want to do something. Um, to re repair. So, right, if we think of the idea of anxiety being our signal that we care about something, then I think we need to come up with, again, with the support of others so you're not alone, with the awareness that you need to let out some of those emotions, then we can think about taking some actions that feel useful and let the anxiety be the kind of the energy source. Uh, that fuels, like anger can be a great energy source, right? Activists often start out like, I'm really angry. And when I'm angry, I want to do something. So a lot of our emotions can be composted into useful action. Anything else? Um, yes, Dr. Greenspan and our wonderful student panelists, what a Incredible discussion, thank you. Um, we would love to be able to open it up for questions. You guys have already, our audience have already submitted questions in the Q&A. Um, we have just a, maybe one or two more minutes left. So I'm gonna ask if you submit questions, um, if it's okay if we send, um, try to send responses to those questions in an email of some sort. And we'll ask if we can move forward to the next part of the, We'll ask it in a chat now, but to the next part of the um, of the webinar, uh, Kevin, can you go to the next slide? Uh, we really want to know how we did, right? We worked hard on this, but we are always willing to improve. We want to improve. We want to make this better. We want to continue to create and curate this space. Um, so if you have your phone in your hand, take a picture of that very short survey. I know when people say short service, they don't really mean it. Ours is really short. And tell us, you know, how we can, how we did. If you don't have a photo, I mean, if you don't have your phone, I'm just going to put that link in the chat for you now. And we ask that you do that. We'll just give you a minute or two 
if you're willing to do it now and just let us know if you're doing it, I'll go to our type form and actually see if you guys are doing it now. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that folks are doing it. The other thing we'd love to ask you to do, we have some requests for you. Uh, Kami, if you shift to the next slide, uh, is to follow us. Um, again, I work for Zero Waste Schools and um, Sophia works for School Gardens. If you took a photo of this and just save our uh, Eventbrite link in your phone, you could follow us. We have some upcoming really cool and really informative workshops on climate change and the advocacy, as well as in May, we'll be doing some uh, waste audit workshops. So the best way to stay updated is to just follow our, um, our, our Eventbrite page. And we're gonna ask you to do the same thing, but on the next slide, go ahead. And we have some upcoming school gardens workshops just next Wednesday. We have a virtual farm tour of John Bown High School, which is in Queens, and they have a really amazing um, farm on their school property. So that'll be really fun at 4 p.m. Um, and then coming up at the end of May, we have our beginner gardener intensive, which is School Garden's flagship event. It is a workshop every day of the week. Um, it is the week of Labor Day. And we have this year envisioning your garden, a year in the life of a garden, healing in the garden with, horti with a horticultural therapist and gardens as community hubs. So if any or all of these uh, speak to you as a beginner gardener, please, please feel free to come to our workshops. Um, and we dropped the Eventbrite link there in the chat also. But we really wanna say thank you for not only coming to our event, but being so active in the chat. Um, I truly think events like this in terms of climate anxiety are some of the best ways to really be able to connect with one another um, and understand that we are all going through a similar process. And of course, hearing our wonderful answers from our panelists, um, really leaving me just so inspired here. So thank you all once again. Can I just ask if we in the audience can just lift up our panelists um, uh, Annalise, Jacob, Ella, and uh, Ulysses, and Dr. Greenspun, and Cami for just being a maverick. Just ask that you give them some uh, positive vibes in the chat and be thinking about them. And, you know, thank you so much. You know, I feel really inspired and, and, and actually working and with these students and watching them plan for this and listening to them and creating space with them really helps me cope with my climate anxiety because it makes me feel like, you know, hopeful. So, you know, let's just support them in any way that we can. If you're an educator, create space for students like these, you know, let's just do whatever we can in our own spaces to support and lift up these wonderful, wonderful students and also this incredible doctor. Thank you guys. Oh, look at all that love in the chat. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for doing that.